can people in the back hear me now? Okay, uh, I'm going to suggest to all my fellow commissioners that you need to be about an inch and a quarter from the microphone um, when you're speaking. Um, can I ask, uh, is this meeting being recorded? Uh, let me put the public on notice that this meeting is being recorded. Can I ask everybody please to uh, turn their cell phones off or now? Thank you very much. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, can I ask everybody please to turn their cell phones off or uh, put them on silent? Thank you. Uh, let me uh, go through the agenda and I have a few comments before we uh, jump into it. Uh, we really have one, other than my comments, we really have one uh, agenda item which is a discussion and vote on uh, some regulatory policy issues. There are five of them. Um, we have uh, this room until 4 p.m. today. Um, if we get done, uh, we will not have a meeting tomorrow. If we do not get done with all five, uh, we will recess, not adjourn, um, and we will reconvene at noon tomorrow at the Gaming Commission. There is a pool going on within the Commission about whether we're going to get done or not today. Um, I don't have a clue. But uh, we do have to stop. Uh, if, even if we're not done, we have to stop at, at 4 p.m. Um, I want to uh, go in uh, some uh, reasonably excruciating detail about where we are um, in the re regulatory process and how today fits into that process. So uh, those of you that have been following us closely uh, will recall that on May 16th, we had a commission meeting where um, as part of the regulatory process, uh, we discussed um, slightly over a dozen policy issues. Uh, we did not talk about the language of regulations. We just discussed policy issues and took votes on those policies. Uh, we then asked uh, our staff um, to take those policy decisions that we made and to embed them into draft regulations. Uh, that process has happened over the last month or so, led by our general counsel, Christine Bailey, under the supervision of our executive director, Sean Collins. Um, I want to thank the staff, um, um, and particularly Christine, for the work involved here. It was uh, an enormous amount of work, given the, uh, the fact that we were uh, working not just with the adult use regulations, but with the medical marijuana regulations. The number of policy issues that we, uh, we uh, voted on were uh, substantial, um, and so I want to thank Christine and the team for the work they've done over the, pre uh, the last month um, in, uh, in embedding our policy decisions into draft regulations. Um, in that process, uh, our uh, general counsel uh, worked with the relevant members of staff based upon the expertise required and also had input from, in most cases, either one or two commissioners, uh, no more than two, so we didn't violate the open meeting rule. Um, and during the course of that process of embedding policy into regulations, a couple of issues came up, um, either things that we just didn't get into in enough detail when we were having our policy conversations that had to be decided to uh, um, get embedded into regulations or some issues that when we try to operationalize policy decisions, some issues where in the uh, opinion of staff there wasn't clear or complete alignment among the commissioners. And so for most of the policy discussions that uh, we had and votes that we took back in May, um, there's no discussion required today. They have been embedded in the draft regulations that have been circulated to the Commission earlier this week and that we will discuss and vote on on Thursday. But um, there were five general policy areas where in the process of uh, embedding them into regulations, uh, there was, on the opinion of staff, a need to have further discussion at the Commission level in public to either uh, make decisions or close um, areas where there uh, was perceived lack of alignment on some of the operational details. I want to make it explicitly clear uh, we are not reconsidering the policy decisions that we made in May. It is really about just translating those policy decisions into uh, language for regulations that we can discuss and vote on on Thursday. So uh, um, we are going to get back into some of those policy um, issues, but we are again not re-examining or re-debating or re-voting on, uh, on those policy decisions that we made back in May. The process that we're going to use today is uh, I'm going to ask uh, our general counsel to introduce the topic. There are five topics, ownership and control, delivery, social consumption, suitability, and removal of product. Um, in each case, um, um, staff with under the leadership of, uh, of our general counsel has developed a memo that was circulated to the commission earlier this week or maybe late last week, if I remember correctly, late last week, I guess. Um, that says here are the issues, um, here are the pros and cons, and here is some proposed language. 
Uh, I'm going to ask, as we go through each of these, uh, for the general counsel to give an introduction to the topic. Um, we have assembled here today between staff and the commissioners that worked on the various issues. I think all of the relevant parties necessary to answer questions that might be raised by the, uh, by the commission. And we'll go through them one by one and discuss and vote. Uh, Based upon the decisions we make on these five issues today, um, the staff has a relatively quick turnaround, uh, which is a day and a half, to um, embed what the language um, and the policies that we agree on today to embed them in the draft regulations. The draft regulations in their entirety have been circulated already by the, uh, by the uh, general counsel um, with placeholders for these five issues. Um, everything else in the draft regulations is hopefully explicitly aligned with what we've decided and the conversation on Thursday I think will be focused primarily on ministerial changes. But we will embed um, these five uh, topics and the decisions we make on these five topics into the language that we discuss on Thursday. Are there any questions? Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, anybody want to wager whether we're going to get done or not today? No? Okay. I think we are, but we'll see. Um, the first topic that uh, we're going to discuss is ownership and control. Um, I'm going to ask um, our general counsel just give an introduction to this. Um, this is one that I worked with the general counsel and the staff on, so I'll, uh, I'll take the uh, lead after uh, the introduction and, and, and talk about it. Um, and then we'll you know, continue uh, through delivery, social consumption, suitability, and removal of product. But uh, if you could start with uh, um, ownership and control, uh, general counsel. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, as you mentioned, the first topic for discussion is ownership and control. Um, as you're aware, the uh, decisions that are made here today will apply not only to the adult use regulations, to the medical use, re as well as the medical use regulations. Uh, this is a particularly important area because it cuts ac across a number of different regulatory sections. Um, it's important to the identification of the individuals and entities who file applications uh, with the commission who are subject to background checks. Um, and so licensing and enforcement uh, played a very significant role in discussing the uh, proposed uh, regulatory language. Um, as I mentioned in uh, the memo, there are a number of uh, new definitions that the Commission should concentrate on. Um, the overarching definition is person or entities having direct or indirect control. Uh, there's also some additional definitions that uh, endeavor to clarify the degree of ownership or control interest that an individual might have. So with that, I'll turn it Great. over to you. Thank you. Uh, so um, this is one, as I said, I, I partnered with, uh, with our general counsel and, and some other members of staff to, uh, to take the lead on. Um, the, from my perspective, the issue here that, that I believe we need to address is that if you go into our regulations and into the legislation, um, there are multiple definitions of control. There are multiple parties that could have control. There are terms like ownership that have not been very well defined. And so we have competing and conflicting definitions of control in our current regulations. Um, what I believe is necessary and what uh, I think with the uh, able assistance of the general counsel we've gotten uh, contained in our draft is a, is a simplification and a clarification. And, and I think simplification and clarification are, is important for two reasons. Uh, one is we have, in the case of change of control um, applications, instructed our staff to see if there are any control issues. Um, we have not given them a whole lot of help in defining control, and so we're trying to um, straighten out the regulations so that we can give clear guidance to our investigative staff when um, issues of control are being investigated. Um, second, I think it's equally important to um, signal to the industry. Um, and to applicants, here's exactly how we uh, define control and how we intend to enforce control limitations. So uh, that's the kind of motive behind this. Um, the high level kind of structure, I think, is pretty simple. Um, it is, uh, as uh, Christine said, uh, there, there's one kind of overarching definition, and that is an individual or, or an entity having direct or indirect control. Um, we have used that language direct or indirect control in all of the sections of the regulations where control is an issue, whether it's um, a kind of license that you're not allowed to have an interest in any other kind of license, 
or whether it's about control limitations, caps on control. So we've cleaned up, because if you look through the regulations the way they are right now, um, in some cases the, the um, restrictions are, are talked about in terms of controlling person. Um, in some cases they're talked about ownership interest or ownership participation. We've just cleaned it up so that in all of those places where there are limitations on, on control, it's individuals or entities having direct or indirect control, which is very explicitly defined in the proposed regulations. Um, in those proposed regulations, the definition of direct or indirect control is pretty straightforward. It's got four possible ways to determine control. One is if you own, or an entity or an individual owns 10% of the equity. Straight, straightforward. Second is if an individual or entity has voting control of 10 or more percent of the equity. Uh, third is the term close associate. Um, in a perfect world, I would have suggested that we eliminate close associate altogether, but it is legislatively defined and mandated. So close associate is defined as someone that has direct or indirect control. And then the last one is the catch-all category, but I think it's incredibly important, which is even if you don't meet any of the first three criteria for control, um, through contract or other means, if you have the ability to uh, influence or make or veto key decisions which are articulated in the, uh, in the draft language, that is de facto control. So we have defined it very carefully. Um, we have, as I said, cleaned up the language so any place there is a cap limitation or restriction on um, control of multiple enterprises, we have used the phrase direct or indirect control with the definition I just articulated. I think that's probably my summary. Um, I, I did, and I, I hate to do this to my, uh, my fellow commissioners, but uh, I did, I have worked and proposed a couple of cleanups from the um, language that was uh, submitted uh, by uh, uh, our general counsel on Friday. They're, they are really minor, but I wanted to just um, hand out um, a document that is my proposed minor edits to what, uh, what was circulated on Friday. Um, it's for, totally consistent with what I just described, um, but I'm more than happy to discuss, answer questions, or have Christine answer questions. Sorry that these are not stapled. Um, the only thing that is different in, in what I just handed out to you than what uh, was circulated on Friday is um, we took out the word owner from any of the restrictions. We, we use the word owner as if you have over 10 percent of the equity in a company, um, but we never use the word owner elsewhere in terms of um, uh, limitations on ownership. The limitations on ownership are a subset of you cannot have control um, um, and ownership is one of the ways that you can have control. So we just cleaned the language up a little bit, didn't change anything substantively in there. Um, I would at this point like any questions or comments. Do you want some time to digest? Um, yes. Sorry, the changes aren't tracked, right? So I don't um, know what's yeah, I got, the only the only change uh, that, uh, I, I apologize for that. Uh, the only change, as I said, is, is that in some cases, for instance, in in, in social consumption, mm -hmm. uh, we said you know if you get a social consumption license, you can't have ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, we just changed that to can't have control, indirect or direct control. Um, so it's just every time there's a limitation on on um, control, uh, we use the word direct or indirect control rather than you know, using ownership and control um, interspersed. Uh, we also, uh, I guess, um, and this is this in the draft that, that was circulated on Friday. Um, the word owner was not dis was not defined um, in the original um, regulations, and so we defined owner as someone that has at least 10 percent of the equity in an entity. Um, we described equity holder or defined equity holder as someone that has equity in a company but not, uh, you know, less than 10 percent. I'm more than happy to just give people some time to read through what I circulated. Commissioner McBride? Um, I 
just had a question about how the changes. Um, I'm sorry. I had a question about how the how the suggested changes to sort of jive with what is currently in the regulations. Sure. Understanding that there is a. Um, we're taking out the, the part that's in 500.050 and replacing it. Um, but my specific question is about the um, right to appoint more than 50% of the directors, right. which right. is currently in the our regulations. Is there a component in here? I just um, it may be something where I'm just not kind of yeah. catching it. Yeah, I, I think we can we can probably address that. I, th I think it's a good point. So so right now the definition of person or entity having di um, direct or indirect control is someone that owns 10% of the equity, someone that has voting rights of 10% of the equity, a close associate or the catch all category, which is a person or entity. Um, that has the right to control through contract or otherwise the authority to make decisions of corporation in, regarding operations, strategic planning, including capital allocations, acquisitions, and divestments, the authority to appoint or remove C-level officers, the authority to make major marketing, production, financial decisions, the authority to execute significant exclusive contracts, or to earn uh, more than 10% of the profits or collect more than 10% of the dividends. I think it's quite easy and, and appropriate to insert in that set of definitions the, the, the ability to appoint 50 percent of the directors because I think that is just that just kind of got lost in the uh, in the translation but I think it's an important thing to put in okay thank you uh, you agree with that commissioner um, and general counsel that's fine mr. chairman uh, yes commissioner uh, Doyle. thank you uh, on independent testing laboratories yep. uh, I just want to remind and I've already flagged this for the team but um, just to make sure it doesn't get lost because I know everybody's doing a lot at once um, right now there is a prohibition from having a person or entity having director and direct control in right. an independent testing laboratory which is appropriate except that we have a special regulation yep. for, the for the islands. So we just need to Get capture that. that provision in there. Yeah, thank you. That's a great catch. Thank you for that. I will integrate that. Thank you. Commissioner Tuttle? Uh, okay, I have two things. Um, Only two? To start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so on the third page, yep. the definition of persons or entities having direct control. Yep. Um, the last bullet point. Earn 10% of profits? Um, no, the last full bullet point. Okay. A person or entity that has rights to control through contract or otherwise the authority or. Yeah. I don't understand I don't, I don't that think the, I think the or is, I think the or is a typo. Is that correct, General Counsel? I'll, I'll address that. Thank you. I mean, it's just, it, it, what we intended to do, and we can clean up the language, what we intended to do is say it, a person or entity has the right to control through contract or other means um, these decisions. So I think we can just clean up the language to make it clearer. Okay, I um, okay. appreciate that. And I'm fine with the language. I think that's in the original yeah. if we just okay. um, yeah. convert so I, I, that. Um, there was some, some uh, <laughs> rapid last minute editing, but that's the whole point of uh, this process is to catch those things. So keep sure, going. Sure, sure. Um, what I would like to do is add including but not limited to, to that bullet point. Okay, I think that's fair. Uh, um, that, did, that increases the ambiguity a little bit, but go ahead, Commissioner or uh, General Counsel. Yeah, I just want to be clear. Um, could you just specify where would that be? Um, I'll work off the original draft. Okay. Um, so it would be a person or entity that has rights to control through contract or otherwise the authority to make the decisions, including but not limited to, and then the sub bullet points. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we just discuss that for a second, though? I mean, aside from the, 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 gra the grammatical correction, um, and this, this is my objective. I'm not, I'm not sure that everybody else would agree with this. My, my objective here was to make things as clear and as easy for our investigative staff as possible by saying when you're looking at control issues, whether it's for a new application or a change of ownership, here are the things that you hear, here are kind of the litmus tests. So the addition of what you just said, well, I understand it. I'm just wondering, um, maybe we could ask the general uh, or enforcement team, uh, does that kind of take away from the specificity that I'm trying to provide them? So what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, I do think that having a list of examples is really helpful and provides some more clarity and specificity. However, uh, I don't think we can limit it to what's on this sub bullet point. So for example, in our guidance, we've given two examples of ways that you might have control um, that I recall were taken from when minority business enterprises are examined. Yep. And one example was 
um, an employee who also works for another entity, and that entity is sort of telling that employee what to do. Right. Um, another example was authority over none of these big decisions, right. but day-to-day -day decisions. So, so, so I would want to make sure that um, situations like that and other situations that we can't conceive of right now would be included. Okay. I guess that, that's, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that makes sense. Um, do others um, have a comment or general counsel? Do you have a concern about that? No, I, I think that's an excellent point, is that we want to uh, provide some specificity, but not um, uh, you know, basically prevent us from recognizing something that we can't anticipate right at this very moment. Okay, thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? Are we uh, ready to take a vote on this with the changes that were discussed just now? Uh, Commissioner, or excuse me, uh, General Counsel? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just want to um, be clear that there's other associated definitions um, that are at issue here, so just in terms of the vote, um, I'll leave it to you to yeah, I, define the vote. I get, could you be more explicit? I, 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 I'm of the opinion we just need to take one vote on, on this entire uh, set fine. of changes. But uh, if you feel otherwise, please. Uh, no, I think that's fine. If there's no further questions, I just want to be clear that there's other uh, definitions. Thank you. State. Commissioner Tunnel? Um, so I had a second point. <laughs> third. <laughs> uh, no, I think I only made one. Okay. So uh, really who's counting? <laughs> um, I also just want to reserve the right, because I haven't read this yes. in detail, to come sure. back later. But it looks good at a glance. Um, so the second point is on page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Yeah, the, nine. aside from not being stapled, they're not numbered. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so okay. can you just tell me where you are, please? So page nine, void marijuana establishment license. So yes. okay. um, the original language was a marijuana establishment is void if the establishment ceases to operate or transfers its location without commission approval or makes a transfer of ownership or control that requires commission yeah. approval. The new language for the second part is... Yeah, I'm not sure why it changed. Okay. So, I, I, yeah, I wanted to... I think we should original. go back to the original language there. Thank you. Uh, do you have that, uh, General Counsel? Yes. Um, there, there I'm was, sorry, unless there was something we're missing about why that well, change was no, made. It's, it's fine. There was some issues raised about whether or not these concepts should be baked into the voidness criteria. I think it's up to the commission as to whether um, to do that. I know licensing enforcement had some concerns about doing so. So if there are commissions that are inclined to include it, we should hear from them as well. But if the commission is not inclined to consider it, we can revert to yeah, the original I guess, language. I, I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you just said. I apologize. Could you just try um, that one more time? Basically, I think there was some discussion of, of expanding the, that category. We're talking about the void marijuana license. If the commission is inclined to consider it, then I think it's important to hear from licensing and enforcement. If it's not inclined to consider it, we, we can revert. I guess I'm still confused. Consider what? Um, the addition of um, a change in ownership and control impacting whether a license is considered to be void or not. Um, there's some risks associated with that. Um, for example, uh, an applicant, I'm sorry, excuse me, a licensee may um, inadvertently be in a state of a change of ownership and control without realizing it. So I think the better course actually is to revert to the original language, but I wanted to be um, honest to some issues that were raised in my individual discussions with the uh, So Paul, do you, you have a comment? Uh, yes, I, I'd agree with the, uh, the general counsel, and I think it's also important to point out that uh, the revised language would also extend uh, as, a, as a basis for uh, taking a, a suspension or revocation action or a denial of renewal, uh, it includes any uh, control violation. Uh, so removing it from the void uh, provision uh, doesn't necessarily uh, restrict the commission from being able to act in okay. that capacity. It just it puts it in the uh, the administrative process. Okay, uh, that that works for me. I'm not sure title. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there other comments or questions, or can we put this to uh, a vote? Great. Uh, then uh, can I uh, ask for a motion, please, to approve the policy and language discussed with uh, all the appropriate changes that uh, were, uh, were made uh, in this conversation? Can I have a motion, please, to approve that? So moved. Can I have a second, please? Second. Uh, let the record show that Commissioner Title made the motion to approve or to approve seconded by Commissioner McBride, all in favor? Aye. 
uh, let the record show the commission unanimously approved the uh, changes to ownership and control. My thanks again to general counsel and, and Paul, thank you for that uh, clarification at the end. Um, I, think, uh, I think we've done well here, so thank you for that. Um, the next topic is delivery. Um, I'm again going to ask the general counsel to give us some context and uh, um, point out the issues that were raised as we translated our uh, policy vote in favor of delivery um, as we translated that into draft regulations. Um, Commissioner, or should, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Um, general counsel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, the next topic for discussion is delivery. As you've noted, uh, delivery has been the subject of significant policy uh, discussion and deliberation um, and vote. So a number of the area, a number of areas on delivery are settled. Uh, that being said, um, in the this discernment process, uh, we did advance in terms of uh, staff's recommendation. Um, in, collaboration with working with specific commissioners on the period of exclusivity, the scope of that exclusivity. And so there's some proposed language in the me memo that was circulated on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, while some of these issues are settled policy decisions, uh, there were concerns raised around some of the <coughs> operational requirements for delivery. And so the uh, various commissioners may want to raise that in okay. the course of their policy discussions. Okay. And with Great. that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, would anybody care to uh, comment on uh, on some of the issues that uh, that the general counsel just raised? Particularly, uh, I was not personally involved in this conversation, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm not sure uh, um, who the right person is. But uh, Commissioner McBride, do you have any comments at this point? I do not. I drafted the uh, lion's share of the adult use delivery regulations, right. so I'm. Okay. Satisfied with how they work, <laughs> you, did a, you did a great job, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, are there other comments, questions on the either issues that uh, that uh, the general counsel pointed out, or anything else um, in this memo, Commissioner Title? Um, <clears throat> yes, I have a few. Um, Do we get a count this time, or just a few? I didn't count them. <laughs> a, few, a few to several. Um, so the first one is on page. Three, uh, with regard to the exclusivity provisions um, that I worked on with Commissioner McBride, um, and I'm making an edit to myself. I'm proposing an edit to myself that I caught afterwards. So the first line is a delivery-only retailer license. License. So there's a Thank typo you. there. Shall be limited on an exclusive basis to businesses with majority ownership comprised of, and it goes on. Um, I'd like to propose the edit shall be limited on an exclusive basis to businesses controlled by and with majority ownership. That seems of. totally consistent with what we just talked about in the previous mm -hmm. conversation. Um, are there any comments or, or questions about that? that? That makes sense to me, but any other opinions? Okay. So we're inserting after um, businesses can you just read that again, uh, Commissioner Tarnow? Yes, we're inserting after businesses controlled by and. Okay. Yeah, keep going, Commissioner Tarnow. Okay. Um, the next one is on page four, under security requirements for delivery-only retailer operations. Um, so number two says a secure locked storage compartment that is part of the vehicle. Number three says a secure locked storage compartment that is secured to the vehicle. And then later on, and I don't have the page number, um, it says a delivery only retailer shall maintain in each vehicle. Um, so I briefly discussed this with Commissioner McBride earlier and wanted to propose that we make all three consistently in each vehicle. I am totally supportive of consistency. So are there any, uh, any comments or questions about that? General Counsel, you're okay with that? I'm fine with that. I'll integrate that change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, keep going. Please. Um, okay, the next page, page five. Um, this will take a moment, and I have yeah, a thing I'd like to 
Tribune. Okay, so is this. It, oh, I'm sorry. This is um, from the report implementing a body worn camera program um, by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2014, and it talks about data storage costs. And the reason I wanted to hand this out, um, and I <laughs> hand highlighted the part I want, parts I want to discuss, is because um, I feel that retaining video of deliveries for 90 days. Um, is high, both for uh, the privacy concerns that were discussed earlier, but also in terms of cost. So this page um, talks about the costs of uh, storing videos um, from body cameras. And um, the quotes from the police chief that I want to read are the highlighted portions. Data storage costs can be crippling. Storing videos over the long term is an ongoing extreme cost that agencies have to anticipate. If the videos are stored on an online cloud database, the costs typically go toward paying a third party vendor to manage the data and to provide other services such as technical assistance and forensic auditing. <coughs> if videos are stored on a in-house server agencies must often purchase additional computer equipment and spend money on technical staff and systems to ensure the data are secure. The New Orleans Police Department has launched a plan for deploying 350 body-worn cameras at an anticipated cost of $1.2 million over five years, the bulk of which will go to data storage. Another department spent $67,000 on uh, to purchase 50 cameras and will spend approximately $111,000 to store the video on a cloud for two years. Managing and storing the data is usually more expensive than buying the cameras. So for these reasons, I wanted to suggest um, instead of rent retaining videos for 90 days, um, retaining the video for seven days, um, unless of course there's a, a concern or an incident, in which case it should be retained indefinitely. Okay, thank you. Are there comments on, on that? Commissioner Doyle? Uh, I'm concerned that seven days might be too short just because sometimes you don't necessarily have someone report an incident that quickly, unfortunately. Um, I wish that were true, um, but perhaps we could ask our compliance team if they have some thoughts on what the typical turnaround for a complaint on an issue. I, I think we can absolutely ask our compliance team. Compliance team? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, Commissioner Doyle, um, to that to that point as well, it's a narrower scope of activity that would be uh, that would be investigated uh, that that video uh, material would be relevant to. Um, so, so it's something that uh, I, I think it's realistic uh, to be able to identify if an investigation is needed within 30 days. Um, and as I understand from Commissioner Title's proposal, it would not affect uh, the, uh, the the stipulation that uh, video footage be retained uh, during the course of an investigation. If I may, I'd like to just provide a little bit of context sure, please. here. Um, so I think the first bit of context is that while um, this report is um, obviously, you know, it's, it's a fair point, um, here we're talking about 350 body-worn cameras in one instance, 50 cameras in another, and then I think there was another where it was something like 200 cameras. So we're talking about a fairly significant uh, number of cameras and data that's being collected. We also don't have a context here for how long the information um, that's collected by the cameras is expected to be stored by these police departments if it is 90 days or if it's in perpetuity. Um, I could imagine that they probably don't have, in other words, I could imagine that they're probably not um, expunging after 90 days. They're, they're probably keeping it for longer than that. So, but setting that aside, that's so I think the context is, is a little bit different here. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at the costs that are associated with the storage of 90 days worth of um, data, what I came up with is that if you have an operation that is delivering um, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, um, you are looking at 1,080 hours uh, potentially, and that's if they are they are delivering consistently for 12 hours every single day, um, and that ends up being if if, it, if you kind of do like the data storage. I'm thinking about a cloud storage. 
Um, it ends up coming out to about $400 a month to store 6.48 terabytes <laughs> of archived storage, and that is 10, that is 1,080 hours, when did you, when did you, 90 when did days, you learn IT? 12 hours. <laughs> This is what you do when you're putting together regulations and you know that your colleagues are going to have questions about particular issues I'm to actually do the legwork and figure out the I, answers. I am very impressed, Commissioner Rupert. So, I, so I, mean, I think I'm just trying to put it into context. I'm happy to discuss the time limits. I'm happy, actually, in the realm of receiving public comment on this. I think this is absolutely an area where people should weigh in, and it should be across the board. People should be weighing in on what, you know, what the costs are that are associated with it, what the appropriate um, amount of time is to be keeping the information, and in fact, whether the policy is, a, is even a sound policy. I mean, I leave all of this open, truly, for public comment, but I do think that before we kind of put out there numbers that make this sound like it's going to be, um, I, I want to do an apples to apples comparison. Sure. So instead of looking at 350 cameras, you know, at a storage cost of $1.2 million over five years, let's do an apples to apples comparison and, and sort of put it, put it out um, and figure out what the right amount of time and perhaps what the right amount of um, storage may be. Commissioner Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, uh, that's basically the point um, I wanted to make. And uh, those are the numbers that the report said they're not necessarily exactly applicable uh, to this program. But the point is that there's a cost to data storage um, in addition to the, the privacy issues. And uh, I agree, this is something that we should put out for public comment in addition to all of the costs that will be um, imposed upon these businesses in particular, knowing that uh, they tend to be the ones um, with the biggest struggles to raise capital. So uh, I look forward to having that conversation after public comment. So the, yeah, they I propose. Think I'm sorry. I think that's absolutely relevant, and I think all of the you know all of the costs that are associated with this, we should be keeping um, an eye on. And I, the news that data storage um, is expensive is you know it's it's not news to to those of us we've been discussing this for a period of time. So I think that it's a fair point. We should. So just to make sure I'm, I'm clear in terms of what uh, we'll put up for a vote, we're, we're proposing to leave the language as is in this section and obviously um, debate it again after the public comment and public hearing period. Yes. Is that, is that acceptable? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, is there a base? I apologize if you said this already, Commissioner McBride, but is there a basis for 90 days? Is that considered um, the standard for how long it would take or? It's what's in our current security um, requirements for any uh, marijuana establishment. They are required um, to maintain their video surveillance for 90 days or the duration of an investigation when they're notified of one, whichever's longer. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, yes, Commissioner Doyle. Just adding as a former defense counsel, that's the, the minimum time they're required to. Some businesses may make the choice to retain um, the video for longer for the purposes of defense um, you know, in a litigation, if it, particularly where you've got vehicles traveling around, sometimes that becomes your best evidence of, no, I did not cut that guy off. He, in fact, slammed into me. If you have it on camera, you know, you have the opportunity to retain that because the court <coughs> window uh, in our state is three years. And so people may want to, for their own protection, retain video for a longer period of time than even our regulations require. So uh, again, just to be clear, um, what we'll put up for a vote is to leave the language as is, which is 90-day retention. Okay, uh, Commissioner Tuttle. Um, okay, the next one is on page uh, eight, the top of page eight, um, and the sentence is: A marijuana retailer may not record or retain any personal information uh, from the consumer consumer without the consumer's voluntary um, participation, e.g. reservations or written permission. Um, and I want to thank uh, the staff for including that, um, which I had requested. However, I just wanted to suggest a language change. Yeah. So um, removing the example of reservations and just making it um, sim more simple, a marijuana retailer may not record or retain any additional personal information from the consumer without the consumer's voluntary written permission. Comments?
Commissioner, uh, um, are there any comments on that? Yeah, okay, take, take your time. Yeah, no, take take your time. This is this this is important. Take your time. We have all day. <laughs> <laughs> Not if I'm gonna win my bet. <laughs> You're fine? Okay. Um, so I've got that noted. Keep going, Commissioner Title. Okay. Um, page nine, general requirements. C3. I'm the, sorry, C3? Yes. The Commission shall be notified in writing of any substantial modification to a delivery agreement. I'm just wondering if substantial modification is defined. And it might be in the rest. General the Counsel? Um, I would leave that up to our licensing and enforcement staff to make a decision as to what a substantial modification would be in the first instance. Okay. Any comments on that? I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Keep going. Um, on page 10, uh, re with regard to the geographical limits, yes. um, I just want to note for the minutes that I continue to not believe that we have authority to limit who can receive deliveries. Um, but if no one wants to have that conversation again, I'm fine with moving on. Anybody want to have that conversation again? Okay. Uh, this is about deliveries of marijuana, marijuana products by delivery only retailer shall be geographically limited to uh, one, the municipality identified on the marijuana establishment license as the delivery only retailer's place of business, and two, any municipality in which a marijuana retailer licensed under 935 CMR 500 may operate, uh, whether or not a marijuana retailer currently operates in that municipality. Yeah, no, I just needed the subsection. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just wanted to hear my dulcet tones. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I suspect we will receive a lot of public comment on yeah, that. that and, yeah. Okay. I'm sure we will. Uh, um, so let's keep going, Commissioner Tom. Yes, I'm scrolling. Okay, on to um, the medical use delivery page, regulations. Can you just give, give me the reference, please. Um, page 21 regarding security requirements for MTC operations. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm starting with number six with regard to a new requirement, I believe, to have a video system with one or more video cameras in the vehicle. Um, I have a concern that applies to several of these new <coughs> restrictions on delivery for medical marijuana establishments, um, but this is the first one. So my concern is that we are not able to add these requirements because I don't believe they comply with Section 7 of Chapter 94I, which reads, the last sentence reads, no regulation of the commission regarding the medical use of marijuana shall be more restrictive than any rule or regulation promulgated by the Department of Public Health pursuant to Chapter 369 of the Acts of 2012 and in effect on July 1st, 2017. So I've raised this um, several times, and it sounds like the best course of action was to bring it up at today's I, meeting. I think that, that makes perfect sense. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, the uh, general counsel to comment, and then we'll ask other commissioners. General counsel? Yes. Obviously, ultimately, it's for the commission to decide on the interpretation of this statutory restriction. Uh, my interpretation of the statutory restriction is that it should be narrowly construed to basically the medical use of marijuana. It's clear from both Chapter 55 
and General Law Chapter 94I that the legislature envisioned that the Commission would have the authority uh, post-transfer of the program to promulgate new regulations, um, as you know, particularly around um, issues of licensing, um, safety, and security. So I, I do think that the commissioner, Commission excuse me, has the authority to promulgate regulations that enhance security requirements. It's not my understanding uh, with these proposed changes that the Commission is intending to um, limit delivery to medical use patients, but rather to making sure that it's as, as secure and safe as possible in order to address its other statutory mandates. Um, so I don't think these particular provisions are implicated by, um, that particular Section 7 implicates these provisions, but at the end of the day, it's for the Commission to decide how to construe that particular restriction. Uh, thank you, General Counsel. Um, Commissioner Title or any other Commissioner, any comments? Commissioner Title? Go ahead. Uh, no one else has comments? Uh, Commissioner Doyle? I had a question. Do the security requirements for MTC delivery line up in parallel with the security requirements for adults, or are there any differences? I don't know which side of the room to direct this question to. I, I uh, respectfully, Commissioner, I think I would defer to licensing and enforcement and to give us the uh, insight into the operational aspects of these regulations since they're the experts. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. The starting point, uh, Commissioner, for uh, the medical uh, home delivery regulations adopts the uh, adult use, the proposed adult use uh, security requirements. Uh, so the answer is that they should be uh, consistent as a starting point. So if a co-located business was uh, doing adult and medical, they are likely, if they are interested in doing delivery, they will have to comply with the adult use regulations and likely, therefore, if they're co-located, incorporate these. So it would only, to the extent we're looking at the issue commissioner title raise, the issue pretty much would lie with the um, standalone MTCs that do not have an adult use component to their business. Correct. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Commissioner McBride. In the experience of licensing and enforcement, um, how consistent are these draft regulations with the protocols that are currently in place? Um, by the handful um, of um, medical operations that are delivering. Is there consistency here? What do, what are those, what do those protocols look like and are they um, substantial or not or is there a spectrum? Uh, Commissioner, currently uh, the uh, home delivery operations of an MTC uh, would be reviewed under the, uh, the Commission's adopted guidance uh, for transportation uh, vehicles under the medical program. Uh, as Commissioner Title uh, had identified, uh, the uh, requirement for security cameras is something that does not exist currently uh, in, in that, uh, that guidance piece. Uh, in, in, in general, uh, our experience with home delivery has been that uh, the transportation guidance does not fully uh, meet the intent of what our security requirements would be uh, as it pertains to vehicles uh, when we're looking at uh, the adult use side. Go ahead. So when this program was functioning under the Department of Public Health and there were deliveries happening under the program, um, are the protocols that are reflected, setting aside the, the video requirement, hmm. oh, well, I guess one question. Is there, to your knowledge, anybody currently delivering that is using a, a video component, or is this brand new to everybody that would be delivering? I'm not certain if okay. any of the vehicles are currently equipped okay. with video. And is this, would, would this be a, I mean, just, I know it's kind of hard because you're sort of dealing with a, a you know, um, a couple of different protocols that exist, right? But um, would this be a substantial modification or substantially new requirements, um, either required or what's required currently or what operators are doing voluntarily? Um, would they be really kind of changing the way that they'd be operating in order to put these into place? 
Commissioner, I, I wouldn't consider it substantial. Um, I, I think these regulations would uh, would clarify uh, what the uh, what the intent of the guidance is, uh, but there's some ambiguity uh, in the guidance. Uh, so, e you know, even if we were uh, dealing uh, home delivery uh, aside, um, just dealing with uh, the security of uh, vehicles uh, engaged in medical operations, uh, we, you know, enforcement would want to suggest reviewing uh, some clarification to what the uh, to what the existing practices are, uh, but. It, in general, I don't I don't see a you know substantial modification of what current operations look like. Thank you. Other questions? More comments? Uh, I have one, but I'll let other people go first. Uh, Commissioner Doyle, you have your light on, which is why I thought you might. Want. Nope, that's just sitting there ready okay. for me to speak. Commissioner Tano. Um, I guess I'll I'll lay out my substantive concerns separate from um, Chapter 94I, and then okay. we can move yeah. on if no one else has comments. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, to the extent that home delivery to patients has been ongoing, there may already be uh, security in place that goes above and beyond our regulations, and to my knowledge, there haven't been incidents, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that seems to me an argument that we should not be putting additional burdens and regulations. Um, and in particular, as it relates to video, I understand that it's statutory, and at the beginning we had a lot of video requirements in place, but as time goes on, it, if we're not seeing incidents and we want to make changes, we should be erring on the side of less video, not more. I just don't see the argument, um, given that we have been hearing from patients who say that delivery is already too expensive, and dispensaries saying that if they don't deliver, um, it's because they don't see it as profitable. I don't understand why we would then make it more expensive by requiring new video systems um, without a public safety basis that I've heard um, and pass that cost on to the patients. I think before we add any new requirements or costs, we should be asking ourselves, what this, is the evidence that there is a problem here that needs to be addressed? Whom are we protecting and from what? And if we don't have an answer to that question, then we shouldn't be adding a cost, particularly as it relates to surveillance. And I'm also concerned, um, lastly, that the legal analysis has been, when it comes to reviewing host community agreements, we got a letter from legislators, but we don't know if we have the authority. Um, when it comes to prioritizing micro-businesses, we don't know if we have the authority. But it, when it comes to surveillance, uh, it's OK. We can assume we have the authority. I find that concerning. Yeah, no, I understand your point. I guess um, I'll just offer my, my opinion on this topic. Um, I, I, I understand and agree with where you're heading philosophically in terms of not unduly burdening um, this, this process or adding costs to either the patients or the operators, most importantly the patients. Um, the only thing I can, I, I can counter that with is if we believe that these requirements, including video, are essential for public safety in home delivery for adult use, I guess I don't understand the argument for why we wouldn't consider it necessary for public safety for medical. I'm dodging the legal question because I don't feel like I have any real basis to respond to the legal question about our authority, but I don't understand other I understand why it might be problematic, but I don't understand the logic for saying we are concerned about public safety for adult use and therefore we believe these video requirements are necessary, but we don't share that same concern for public safety on the medical side. I accept your point that nothing has happened thus far. I, I'm certainly not willing to make a big wager. That, that nothing will happen in the future. So that's, Chairman, that's, I, that's my concern. Mr. Chairman. Uh, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Flanagan. This is sort of a naive question, um, and I apologize for asking of it, but if there's going to be an instance that's going to be reported, is it to the local police department or to our licensing and enforcement division, or both? Because I'm, I'm, actu I'm actually concerned as to where the data would be, and do we have access to that data if there were instances, and how that actually would be reported. Okay. Um, from a from a consumer standpoint, I think that 
you know, we want people to be able to get the medicine that they have. It's certainly something that's important. I think from the adult use side, that's a whole different conversation um, when we're not talking uh, medicine. But I also am concerned that we're focused on data that might not be there yet. I mean, you know, this agency is two years old. We don't right have yet. a lot of the data that we need to do anything, really. Um, when you look at our research agenda, when you look at all the things that the initiatives we want to take, um, a lot of it's anecdotal. So who's got the data? Uh, Paul, would you like to respond? Commissioner, uh, uh, the incident reporting requirement would extend to, uh, to both uh, local law enforcement as well as uh, the commission for any uh, breach in security or instance of diversion. So then my question is then, do we have reports over the last so many years saying there have been no breaches of security or there have been no incidences. Um, I find it hard to believe there's not even one instance that might have happened. Commissioner, and, and you know, this is, I guess, speculating a bit, but part, part of the challenge, particularly as we look at the, uh, the diversion context uh, for, uh, for any vehicle transports, but in, in this context for, uh, for, for patient delivery, for MTCs making uh, home deliveries, uh, they are required under the existing guidance to videotape uh, and, and document uh, their inventory manifests, both at the point uh, of uh, uh, going out and coming back in. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we don't have a, uh, an insight into what that diversion activity uh, you know, could have been. So the absence of uh, uh, complaints, the absence of, of, of incidents being reported, uh, it may be a case of you know, the lack of uh, ability to detect. So the answer is then we don't really know. I, I mean, in all honesty, um, and in that case, I'm willing to err on the side of caution, given that this industry is going to um, grow and, and the fact that there may be more medical patients online, uh, that I don't see a problem with video systems and, and reports. And Commissioner, if I, if, sorry, Please, if I could just add uh, just one point to sort of consider in the context of, of making these decisions. Uh, uh, delivery services are required uh, to have uh, their inventory tracked uh, in, in the Commission's seat to sales system of record. Uh, so that is a, a, another point where uh, we are able to uh, have an understanding and, and be able to look into uh, that activity. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Commissioner Doyle. Just to clarify one issue, um, we are expressly authorized under the statute to um, pass regulations regarding minimum security requirements for licensees sufficient to deter and prevent theft and unauthorized entrance into areas containing marijuana, which shall include but not be limited to the use of security cameras. So I think with regard to the statute, the legislature did expressly contemplate the use of security cameras. So I think our authority is clear in that regard. Commissioner uh, McBride. Uh, Commissioner Doyle said what I was about to say, so. Yeah. Commissioner Tyler. Uh, just so we're clear, um, these agents have all passed background checks. They are required to have a manifest when they leave they are required to have the manifest signed. Um, and there's already video requirements of when they leave and the manifest is being filled out? Correct. Okay. And are there any incidents that you're aware of, cr criminal incidents? Not, not that I'm aware of uh, that have, have resulted in a, in a finding. Thank you. Oh, should okay. I move on? Um, yeah, I'm going to. I'm, Yes, I'm, I'm keeping those. We'll probably come back and, in my opinion, have a separate vote on this and other matters if they're similar or not in the resolution. But let's go through and get the whole entire list. Thank you. Can I, can I just? Uh, yes, Commissioner McBride. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I don't find it that surprising that there have not been incidents. Um, I, it's a relatively small program that's being operated right now by medical operations. Um, there are just a handful. And so I'm, I don't think that we need to. I don't think the context of this necessarily needs to be, have there been incidents? That's a relevant question. We should ask it. But I also think you know, a lot of the requirements that we put into place, whether we're talking about security or we're talking about a lot of other provisions, including packaging um, and labeling and you know, other components talk about you know, environmental issues, it's deterrent. Mm -hmm. There are pieces that we put into place in our regulations that are intended to deter. Um, bad things, right, to deter bad actions. And I think that 
we should view it as, um, we should appreciate the fact that it may be that it's largely working um, to, to say that, you know, you have these protocols, we follow these protocols, and it prevents things from happening. So um, I would just, yeah. you know, put that into, into the hopper for folks to think about that there is a, a deterrent aspect of this we need to be contemplating too. I appreciate that, Commissioner McBride. Um, so I'm, I'm going to suggest that we move on uh, to continue down your list. We will come back and vote on this particular topic um, before we vote on the entire issue. But uh, if you could keep going, Commissioner Title. Sure. Thank you. Just finding the page. Pardon? Just finding the page. Okay. Uh, note to uh, general counsel, can we have page numbers in the future? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, page um, 24, which is under orders. I'm sorry, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe I will be the only, well, I won't make any guesses, but um, <laughs> it's fine if, if nobody else wants to discuss this and we can move on to the last one. Um, the requirement that uh, patients may not be may not receive deliveries if they're in dorms, bed and breakfast establishments, hotels, motels, or other commercial hospitality operations. I supported this under adult use, um, but I would not support that restriction for patients um, because they may need a delivery because they have a debilitating condition and they may have a reason why they're in one of these places. Yep. Can I ask for comments on that, please? Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, I think I'm going to put that in the category. Uh, yes. Commissioner Doyle is having computer problems. Can you imagine? Can you can you imagine that? Go ahead, uh, time. Is there? Does, I'm not sure which side to uh, address this to, but is there such a restriction currently for patients? With regard to where they can receive deliveries, Commissioner, there is a uh, there's a similar pre-verification process, uh, but I would have to uh, I'd have to verify that uh, for you. But I can do that. Okay, because it seems to me that if there is not such a restriction already, then I can't imagine um, what 94I Section 7 what situation it is intended to apply to, right. if not this one. No, I didn't. Can uh, is that something that uh, you can? Try to uh, process real time for us, Paul. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Doyle. Pay no attention to the letter. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner McBride. Um, I just have a comment on a different section. Or can we just hold it for a sec, please? Uh, okay, so I just have one last one. Uh, wait, I just want to um, see whether we should move on for this. Uh, um, and I'm not, I'm not getting any comments here, so I actually I'm going to put that in the category of video for medical delivery, and we'll come back and, and probably vote on that before we vote on the entire regulations. Sure. Um, okay. And may I ask uh, Councilor Billy to confirm is it still your opinion that we have the authority to place that restriction on patients? Um, well, I, what I would say is this: is that I th think that restrictions that implicate patient access the commission should scrutinize those carefully. I'm not clear um, under the process that's laid out here if at the end of the day that would be more restrictive or be less restrictive. In other words, if there's a pre-verification process at the front end, it might be that the identification check during the course of a delivery would be easier. Um, I think this is one of the from my perspective, one of the reasons why you have a draft regulation process is in order to put out a proposed policy decision and have the community comment on it. So I would welcome um, feedback from patients as, the, as to whether they would be amenable to this process, find it to be more or less restrictive th along those lines. I, I think we need to make our best decision subject to learning and, and adjusting based upon feedback if we may, if we so choose. But I, I, I'd rather us make the best decisions we can 
rather than um, say, well, we'll just throw things out and see what, uh, what the policy is or what, what the feedback is. So I think this is one that, at least in my opinion, requires uh, um, a further discussion and, and a vote. Um, before I ask you to keep going, Commissioner Title, um, Commissioner McGrath, you said you had a comment or additional? It's on a different provision. Okay, so then let me let Commissioner Title finish up her list and I'll come back to you, Commissioner McBride. Commissioner Title. Uh, so the last item is the patient pre-verification process. Um, I can't imagine the purpose of adding that. Um, under adult use, it makes sense to have a pre-verification process because they don't have to provide anything other than an ID. In this case, the patient has already gone through an extremely long, burdensome, expensive verification process and to then add to receive delivery that they have to receive a pre-verification um, which unless they receive accommodations will require them having to go to a physical location um, that contradicts the whole reason that they're receiving a delivery. Uh, I just don't understand the point of it. I think it's really unfair to patients and I think that if we don't see requiring patients to go through a whole new pre-verification process as more restrictive than not going through a pre-verification process, then I would question our understanding of the word restrictive. Gotcha. Uh, can I ask general counsel or uh, enforcement staff or perhaps Commissioner McBride um, it, um, any thoughts on why this was included? Uh, I mean, I understand the objective. I understand the objective of consistency mm -hmm. between adult use and and uh, and medical, except where it doesn't make sense. Um, this is a, one instance where I'm not sure it does make sense. I, I, but before I jump to any conclusion, I'd like to hear some thoughts and and, and logic behind this suggestion. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So f from this language on patient pre-verification, uh, it, it looks like there is a need to have this conform closer to the uh, verification process uh, in the existing uh, guidance uh, for, uh, for home delivery. Uh, there, there, is a, um, there is a requirement for there to be verification at the uh, MTC. Uh, however, there's a, a more detail in terms of what the, uh, the alternative for that is uh, if you are unable uh, to access uh, the MTC, uh, being able to uh, have your um, have your patient registration information verified uh, by the MTC, not in person, uh, but but through other means. Uh, so it appears there would be a need to have this uh, revised to conform uh, with that process. So if we were just to substitute the language here with the language that's already there, um, with respect to alternative ways to verify if you're unable to come into the uh, the facility. Does that address your concern, and is, does that raise any concerns for you? Certainly doesn't raise any concerns uh, from, from an enforcement perspective. I think it actually would, would clarify, uh, and, and specifically in 3B, may make accommodations for uh, a consumer. Uh, that language uh, should be uh, you know, more mandatory in terms of uh, uh, expressing that there is an uh, alternative process for that. Does that address your concern, Commissioner Title? No. Could you pass it? Um, I appreciate Basically. that. I think it would be an improvement, certainly. I um, mean, I appreciate that accommodation was added, uh, but I don't understand the basis for requiring a pre-verification when they've already gone through patient verification. You have a comment on that, uh, Paul? Uh, Commissioner, uh, I, my understanding is just that uh, fr from the guidance, there is a um, there is a process for having uh, the home delivery status uh, verified at the. Uh, uh, at the MTC, so just so that's in, you're saying in place right now for the medical regulations is that guidance? Uh, in guidance, yeah, in, not in reg, but in guidance. Correct. Okay. Uh, so it's certainly from a policy point of view, I, I, I recognize that there's uh, there, there's a legitimate uh, discussion on that, uh, but but just strictly from a, a point of view of, of what the uh, uh, existing standard is and and how that would uh, comport with uh, with this standard. Okay. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Flanagan. Under subsection B of the patient pre-verification, it says a delivery-only retailer may make accommodations for a consumer who is disabled so long as pre-verification is performed in person and includes examination of a valid unexpired government photo ID. Um, during the public comment period, I would like to have the word disabled look at because I think that um, you can have a debilitating disease and not technically be disabled. Um, and I think that it narrows the scope of um, the category of consumer that may be able to have this accommodation made for them. Uh, so I, I think I get what the point of that, that term is, and I'm not trying to wordsmith, 
I just think no, the context that it comes in is just is greater than we think. That's a valid point. Thank you. Um, Commissioner McBride. I think that Commissioner Tyler raises very fair points here, and I think that we should give some consideration um, as to whether um, this is necessary. I think that um, we should get feedback on that. I would say at a minimum, I would like for us to be considering as um, standard operating procedure that if we see that there's merit to requiring some sort of interaction um, with an MTC and a patient prior to delivery happening, understanding that it's likely in the context of delivery being a much more frequent and you know a common occurrence, that um, the accommodation be that you are able to to verify via Skype or something like that, okay. um, so that you can we can make it that the standard is that um, you don't necessarily need to appear in person at an MTC. So I, I would. Put that out there as something for consideration in the yep. context of thinking about this generally, um, whether we do need to have a pre-verification, understanding that patients do go through a process of um, you know, registration, providing a lot of their information, um, and that, they, um, that information is already um, maintained in a, a couple of different forms. Okay. So I, uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm totally tuned into the process of uh, using these draft regulations to elicit public feedback and public comment. Um, but I do think that we need to put out kind of a starting point in terms of our best judgment um, prior to that. So I, I think there should be a discussion and perhaps a vote on you know, the draft regulations, whether they should include this requirement or not. But we're going to go out and elicit information and feedback, as you just said. So I guess then my suggestion would be that this, <coughs> that this would stay in, but with the modification okay. that there be, um, as a standard, okay. um, an accommodation, or not an accommodation, that the standard be that you, that um, <coughs> verification performed via video okay. conference. I, I'm going to suggest that we, uh, we leave that as not one of the, the items that we take a vote on um, prior to uh, uh, voting on the entire uh, recommendation for this uh, topic. Um, do you have anything else, Commissioner McBride? Uh, Commissioner Taubman. Commissioner McBride, do you have an additional comment? No, you don't. Okay. So let me, um, I'm going to just summarize where I think we're at and make sure I haven't missed anything. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there are two changes to the draft memo that seem to be non contentious. Um, one was the substitution of, uh, or the addition of the word of control. Um, the second was uh, with respect to uh, explicit approval for retention of personal information. Um, I did not hear any dissonance on those two. Go ahead. Uh, the third one was in the vehicle. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Third change was in the vehicle. So th those three, um, when we vote on this entire matter, the vote will assume that those three changes will be made. Um, there are three changes, though, that I don't feel like we got to alignment on, and so before we vote on the entire topic, I'd like to ask for a vote on these three topics. Uh, one is the requirement of video um, in medical delivery vehicles. And so I uh, would like um, Commissioner Title to make a motion uh, with respect to that, the, 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 what she'd like to see change there. Is that, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Commissioner Title. Uh, I'm sorry, which item was that? This was the one about, uh, uh, removing, well, I guess the, the motion can be pretty simple, which is removing the requirement for video in medical delivery vehicles. Is that, is that an accurate statement of your? Mm -hmm. So okay. can, can I ask for a motion to remove that? Sure. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> if you'd like to articulate it differently, that's fine. Oh, no, it's, no, that's fine. Um, motion to remove the requirement for uh, video system added to uh, delivery requirements for medical treatment centers. Thank you. Um, can I have a second, please? Second. I'll let the record show that Commissioner Title made the motion seconded by Commissioner Flanagan. All in favor? Aye. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I All opposed? Nay. Nay. Um, let the record show that the, uh, the motion was uh, uh, defeated by a vote of uh, one in favor. Commissioner Title, four opposed. Commissioners Doyle, Hoffman, Flanagan, and McBride. Um, second um, issue that I believe is open for uh, discussion and vote is uh, um, removing the restrictions on de location for delivery, so allowing for patient delivery to occur um, uh, in places that are explicitly um, excluded from adult use delivery, so dorms, um, 
um, hotels. So we're removing those restrictions from the medical delivery. Um, can I have a motion to remove those restrictions from uh, medical delivery? Motion to uh, remove the restrictions on where patients may receive home delivery. Okay. I just have one question. Yes, please. Does that include dormitories and subsidized housing? Uh, I would be open to changing it. Do you have a proposed alternative motion? If I can do a friendly amendment that. Can you um, put your microphone on? If I can have a friendly amendment that um, removing the restriction does not include dormitories or subsidized housing. Okay. okay. So, so we, uh, would you like to restate the motion, please? Yes. So motion to remove the prohibition for patients from receiving deliveries in bed and breakfast establishments, hotels, motels, or other commercial hospitality operations. Thank you. You can have a second, please. Second. Let the record show Commissioner Tuttle made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Flanagan. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry, did it? All opposed? Commissioner Doyle? I'm still okay. <laughs> I'm trying to process, sorry. And I, I did not, well, while she's processing, Commissioner Flanagan, then, um, aye. you said aye. I'm sorry, I, I did miss that. Please take your time. Mr. Chair, may I just have a moment of clarification? So the proposal would be to eliminate everything but dormitories and federally subsidized housing? Yes. Medical. Yeah, for medical delivery. For medical, yeah. Thank you. So delivery only retailers shall be prohibited from delivering marijuana or marijuana products to? This is a, MTC. we're talking medical, not It's for MTCs. Yeah, no, no. Uh, and I may be on the wrong section. I'm trying to fly through and make sure the actual language is in front of me, and it's difficult to do because my laptop is backing up. So. But I think I'm in a parallel <laughs> universe. <laughs> so we would just be deleting. Uh, we would be deleting um, bed and breakfast, hotels, motels, and other commercial hospitality operations, and leaving the rest. Thank you. Um, let the record show that the uh, motion was approved unanimously by the commission. Uh, the last item that I have that also I think requires a vote before we vote on the entire topic um, is the pre-verification requirement for patients for home delivery. Or eliminate that, uh, Commissioner Title. Do you have proposed language for a motion? Uh, I do, but I'm I'm open to friendly amendments on it. Okay. Please. Okay. Motion to um, remove the pre-verification requirement process for patients. Thank you. Second. Um, let the record show that the motion was made by Commissioner Title, seconded by Commissioner Doyle. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Uh, let the record show that the amend the. Uh, pro Motion was approved by a vote of three in favor, Commissioners Doyle, Title, and Hoffman, uh, with Commissioners uh, McBride and Flanagan voting nay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would now like to ask for a motion to approve the uh, entirety of the memo um, on delivery subject to the changes that were made both uh, um, by consensus around uh, language and control, retention of personal information, um, the insertion of the phrase in the vehicle. Um, additionally, we will delete the requirement on location um, that prevents delivery to dorms, hotels, and so forth, as was just voted on, and also we would eliminate the pre-verification requirements. So with those changes, I would like to ask for a motion to approve the staff memo um, on delivery. So moved. Can I have a second, please? Second. So let the record show that Commissioner Doyle made the motion to approve, seconded by Commissioner Title. All in favor? Aye. I'm sorry, I did not. Um, all opposed? Nay. Uh, let the record show that the uh, motion was approved by a vote of four in favor, Commissioners Doyle, Title, Hoffman, and McBride, um, with Commissioner uh, Flanagan voting nay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know about you, but I need a break. So um, I'm going to propose that we take a 10 minute break. It is 20 past 11 on um, our watch. Uh, we will uh, reconvene at 11.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>